Hi there, my Wire Religion friends. Professor Anthony Sweat here. Welcome to another great episode of the Wire Religion podcast. I have a son of mine who was recently ordained a deacon, and he finally became old enough to go to the temple to do baptisms for the dead. To say that he was excited to finally go uh, is an understatement. My wife and I took him this last January as early as we could get an appointment. And as we were walking up to the temple, my son suddenly stopped and turned around to look up at the wording written above the temple doors, holiness to the Lord, the house of the Lord. I happened to have my phone out at that moment and I snapped a picture of his innocent little face gazing upward and pondering the power in that declarative gold lettering. I thought about the prophecy in Malachi chapter three, that the Lord would purify the sons of Levi or that he would make them holy so that they could offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness in the house of the Lord. Although my son is a sweat boy, I understand that he is also a modern day son of Levi, as am I, and as are all Latter-day Saints who serve the Lord in the temple, as Joseph Smith taught, and that the Lord will purify and sanctify each of us through his grace and through his holy house for God's own work and his glory. Although you and I are mere mortals, the promise of the Lord in the scriptures is that, quote, I am able to make you holy, end of quote. Professor Gay Strathern of BYU Ancient Scripture has recently published a great article called Holiness to the Lord and Personal Temple Worship, published in the book Approaching Holiness by the RSC. God is talking to Moses and he says, I am holy. And his desire is that all of Israel becomes holy like me. Right? So that's his, I want you to become. I don't want you to just do. I want some kind of change to happen with you. In this episode, Professor Strathern takes us metaphorically up Mount Sinai and into the mountain of the house of the Lord, the temple, to discuss ways that God can purify and prepare a holy people who serve him in his holy house. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Recently, Professor Jared Halverson of BYU Ancient Scripture sat down with his colleague, Professor Gay Strathern, who is currently serving as an Associate Dean of BYU Religious Education, to talk about her 2021 article, Holiness to the Lord and Personal Temple Worship, published in the book Approaching Holiness by the Religious Studies Center. In part one, we like to look at why this study was done, and here Professor Strathern will kick off this interview by discussing concepts about gradations or levels of holiness and some of the nuances of the Hebrew language when it talks about different kinds of holiness. So here is Dr. Jared Halverson interviewing Dr. Gay Strathern. I'm here with Gay Strathern today. Gay, so grateful to be with you. Thank you, for, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's so good. Every time I've had a chance to sit down with you, I have learned, I have been blessed, and so I'm grateful that our, our listeners will have that chance today. For those that haven't yet had the privilege of learning from Gay Strathern, she wears many hats here at Brigham Young University. She is the Associate Dean of Religious Education. She's a professor in the Department of Ancient Scripture. And just an amazing teacher and writer and mentor and friend. So again, thank you for joining us today. We're going to be discussing an article you wrote recently that's been published in a beautiful book called Approaching Holiness, Exploring the History and Teachings of the Old Testament. Your particular article refers to holiness to the Lord and personal temple worship. I noticed that in your previous 
interview here on Why Religion, you discussed an article that you'd written about keeping the Sabbath day holy. And so holiness then in the Sabbath, holiness now in temple worship, you know, that seems to be a, a common thread for a lot of the work that you do, which is, is beautiful. Why do you think holiness is such an important topic? In the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, it is a really, really important uh, part that kind of pervades throughout the text, the concept of holiness and getting holiness and being holy. And um, so one of the things that, that just started me going is uh, that I was going to write this very symposium, which was, um, it was based on the gospel of Jesus Christ in the Old, Old Testament. And... Um, I had a friend and I had been talking and uh, he recommended to me uh, a, a book that was written um, for, with an academic press um, and it was entitled um, Holiness and Purity in Mesopotamia. Hmm. And uh, I started reading this and actually this is kind of a little bit of a weird thing thing is a friend recommended it to me, but the author used to be my home teacher, right? (laughs) So uh, I was particularly interested in what he had to say. As I I read this book, I was learning so much, right? It it helped me in really, really important ways. And it started my mind kind of going, in particular, what he had to teach about um, about holiness. And so it started me thinking, okay, what are the implications of this in the Old Testament, what's the implications in terms of uh, the tabernacle and the priestly service? And and then I started thinking, um, is there something that from this that might be helpful for modern saints as they also think about their personal temple experience and, and what's happening? Would it could this maybe help to deepen or nuance uh, some of their thoughts about what they're doing when they're going to the temple? And so that's really what what started me off with it. Oh, that's beautiful. And and I look forward to the second part of our conversation where we can really dig into that personal application and and help the saints deepen their experience in the temple. To get there, you begin your article talking about an experience you had in another temple of the Lord, a mountain of the Lord, namely Mount Sinai. Can you you hike us up the mountain? (laughs) Well, this is one of those uh, pivotal moments in my personal spiritual journey. There are a number of them, but this would maybe even be in the top three because of the impact that it had on me. Uh, So um, uh, I was part of one of the first uh, study abroad groups in the New Jerusalem Centre back in 1987. I came from Australia, which was a little bit different. I didn't come through the BYU route. Um, But I knew that uh, this was opening. Uh, Elder Faust actually had come to our state conference and said, uh, the Jerusalem Centre is about ready to open. And any of you who want to go, this is not just for BYU students. (laughs) Personal invitation, not bad. Well, the the rules have changed now. It is just for BYU students. But he says, you should go. And and I, when that happened, I had tingles up and down my spine and I did something that I didn't do then and I certainly don't do now. I actually went up to approach Elder <laughs> Faust and say, uh, so how do I do this, yeah. right? And he told me he'd contact me. Within two months, I was at the Jerusalem Centre. And one of the things I loved about that is that you go on site to talk about things. Right. So uh, after the semester was over, they had an add-on trip to Egypt and uh, I decided to do on that and then went. Uh, we took a large detour down to Mount Sinai, right? So we get there after being hours in the bus. Um, uh, we get to participate in a, a meal at a Bedouin camp. That was just wonderful. And then our professor said, uh, you need to go to bed, right? Because we're going to get up at 3 a.m. Um, and <laughs> climb this this mountain. Um, but you know what young adults do, go to bed early. Yeah, it didn't happen. But at <laughs> three o'clock, they really did uh, wake us up and said, here we go, here we go. Now, um, in another life in Australia, I was a physical therapist. And so uh, I had uh, helped a little bit there with people who had some injuries and things. And so I was designated as the first aid um, kit pack mule for <laughs> to carry it up the mountain. And it was huge, right? This yeah. wasn't a little thing. It was a, uh, a massive kind of, in my mind anyway, uh, 
container and was heavy. And so I put that on and I didn't mind so much, but we started climbing up the mountain and I was with my friends. We're having a good time. We're doing it by starlight. And I noticed that uh, I started to fall behind mm. my friends a little bit. And so I thought, oh, I've got to keep going. <laughs> so I hurry up and catch up to them and then it would happen again and I'd keep doing that. And, and I started getting really, really tired. Not the fact that we were just climbing at 2,500 foot mountain. <laughs> and it got to the point where I was kind of struggling physically a little bit. And uh, I remember the thoughts going through my mind and I'm going, and why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. um, if I stopped here, isn't the sunrise going to be just as magnificent? Oh, Do I yeah. really need to keep keep going with this, carrying this hack? And, and my friends would be coming, what's wrong with you, Gay? Come on, hurry up, hurry up. But I'm carrying it, not one of them offered to take the pack going <laughs> up, right? But my, my, you know how your knees get jellified when you're doing that and that's what happened and, you know, I'm getting to the end of this. Uh, it's about a two and a half hour tr trek, right? And I'm getting to the end and just as I can see the top and sun's beginning to come up, the blessed monks who built this built 700 steps, 700 of them, and they're not... Uh, even steps, you know, some are right, six inches right. high and some are a foot high <laughs> and on my knees that was just horrible. But I thought, here we go, all right. And so I counted every blink in one of them, right, <laughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, until eventually I got up to 699, 600 and, uh, 700, and then I just collapsed at the top, wow. right. I'd, I'd made it but, you know, I was, um, I was exhausted. But as I kind of collapsed and I rolled over, I looked out and the sun came up at that time and I saw God in his pristine handiwork. And that was amazing to me. It just filled me with so much awe. And then while we were there, uh, we got together with our teachers and we talked about the supernal events that happened with Moses um, on Mount Sinai and uh, the experiences he had as he entered the presence of God. And then we had a testimony meeting and the spirit for me was so palpable that 35 years later, I can still remember those feelings, right? And so, but when we came home from uh, that, uh, Anne Madsen uh, gave a devotional uh, that she entitled Dare to Ascend. And she did it specifically because she knew we'd just climbed uh, Mount Sinai. And one of the things that I remember from that devotional was uh, sometimes as we embark upon a spiritual journey, sometimes we can get caught up with the idea of um, uh, being willing to settle, um, to not pay the price to go all the way up the mountain. And, and that made me think because I thought, oh, gosh, just talk to me because I was having those thoughts. Uh, what would it have been like if um, I had stopped halfway up the mountain? Uh, the sunrise would have still been good, but what would I have missed out on um, uh, with that, that spiritual experience as part of this, this physical journey? And so I've always thought about this experience and thought about my life in terms of I'm on this spiritual journey. Um, and sometimes it's hard, right? It's physically hard as well as spiritually hard. Uh, am, am I going to give up halfway up the mountain or is this something that I'm going to continue doing to be able to experience all that God wants to bless me with or am I going to settle for something less? In your article, you talk about this concept of graded holiness. And I think a mountain is such a perfect example of that because the, the perspective does change change right. over and over as you as you continue yeah. the ascent. Can, can you walk us through that idea of, of the gradation of holiness? Yeah, I think um, the, the point is that it's not just we're in a state of holiness or we're in a holy place or we're not, mm -hmm. that there are uh, levels of it. And I think we see this most clearly when we think of the Israelite tabernacle, right? Um, so... Uh, the tabernacle represents a journey, right, mm -hmm. as all temples do. And it's a journey where we leave behind the earth and the things of the earth and the things that are important to us in the earth. Um, and we make this transition to go from uh, what, what scholars call profane space, which is the opposite of sacred, 
we leave that behind and the, the shift is a demarcation, right? The tabernacle had a tent kind of wall and coming up to that and going through that, it was a visual that we're leaving behind the world and we're entering into some sacred space. And then in the tabernacle, there were three major areas, right? There's the outer court, which was more holy than the world. Um, but then you had the sanctum proper and you go into that and you had the holy place, which is, again, a different level of holiness than the court. And then the ultimate is the holy of holies, uh, which in Hebrew is the most holy place, right? Um, and we see the gradations, not just in terms of the walls or the veils or the barriers, but um, also in terms of the number of people, right? Everybody can be outside in the world. Uh, fewer people are in the out of court. Then it's just the priests that end up in the holy place. And then it's just the holy, uh, the high priest who mm -hmm. enters the holy of holies. So there's this sense of movement. Um, but also, I think by the decreasing numbers, it suggests to me, is that fewer and fewer people are willing to pay the price mm -hmm. to go all of the way into the presence of God, right? So that, that sense of it's not that there's no holiness in the outer court or in the holy place, but there are levels of this journey of we increase our holiness as we prepare to enter the presence of God. That's powerful. I'm already thinking of my own temple worship and similar journeys and similar experiences uh, with that, that sense of of ascent up the mountain of the Lord. That's, yeah. that's beautiful. In your article, you 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 gave us, especially us non-Hebrew scholars, uh, a beautiful lesson on some of the nuances in the in the language of the Old Testament as okay. it discusses holiness. Okay, uh, is is that? Can you walk us through that? The word for holiness is comes from the three basic consonants are kof, dalit, sheen which in English is kind of a Q sound, a D sound, and then a SH sound. And so that's what holiness uh, is the base word for holy, the idea of holiness. Uh, what that means in its technical sense, though, is it means something that is set apart. Uh, it's removed from common use, and it's often used in kind of uh, sacred ritual types of things. So that's where we kind of get this, this basic word um, for holiness. But what um, uh, uh, Jan Wilson's book did for me is that some of the ways that that word is built upon has different nuances um, that aren't picked up in the King James translation. So for example, the noun form of the word is kodesh, right? Um, but an adjective form is kadosh. So this all coming from this these three consonants. But uh, Wilson's book kind of indicated that it's much more uh, nuanced than just being a noun and an adjective, that the words are used differently in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and kodesh is... Um, so it's more than just holiness as a noun and holy... As an ad adjective, yep. there's there's something deeper there's here something in the Hebrew. There's something more going on there, yeah. So it's kodesh is um, is he describes it as something that is static, uh, in the fact that it describes the divine realm, right? The divine realm is holy, but it's often that it is holy because it's been declared holy, right? Is that the kind of the static state you were describing yeah. where almost across the line, I'm, I'm on the mountain now versus I'm, I'm not, yeah. or I'm in the sanctuary versus outside? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but kadosh is a much more dynamic word. Um, and so let me give you two examples that maybe please, help please. us sort this out. So in Exodus chapter 3, um, we have when Moses first goes up to on Mount Sinai and sees the burning bush, right? We're all familiar mm -hmm, with that mm -hmm. story. Um, after he sees the burning bush, the, the, um, the, the Lord speaks to him out of the bush and out of the fire and says, and I'm quoting, draw not hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place wherein thou standest is holy ground, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, the dirt on Mount Sinai is not in and of itself holy, but it has been declared holy. And in this case, it had been made holy by the presence of God, right? That's what made it holy. And the word here is used, this is holy ground, is Kodesh, right? So later on in Exodus, when uh, Moses has brought the people out of Egypt and they're camped at the base of um, Mount Sinai, in Exodus 19, Moses again is invited to come up onto Mount Sinai to be with the Lord. Um, And while he's there, in chapter 19, uh, we read um, the Lord saying to Moses, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. All the earth is mine, and ye shall be a kingdom of priests and an holy nation." Right. But what's interesting and what I learned from uh, Wilson's book is the word here is Kadosh. It's not Kodesh. So we've got two passages of Moses going up onto Mount Sinai and we have this discussion on holiness, but they're using different words. Right. So what's the implication um, of that is what I was was thinking about. So um, I I understand the, the first one. It's. Kodesh, because it's been declared holy. But when he comes up the second time, God is talking not about dirt, (laughs) but he's talking about people. And he's about to enter into this covenant with them. And he's giving us, I would suggest, an insight of what's the purpose of this covenant, right? What's What's he trying to do with entering, choosing them out of all people to be um, a part of this covenant? And he uses the word kadosh. Right now, here's the thing that's really interesting to me. In the Hebrew Bible, when God is described as holy, he is only ever described as kadosh. He's never described as kodesh. So always the dynamic state. Yes. Never just the the static. Right. Wow. And so why is he kadosh? Well, in part because what does he do? He uses his whatever to help others become holy, others to invite them into this holy space, the divine realm. So he's an active participant, not just in terms of who he is and his state, but in using that to help others to become as he is. And so one of the things I love about that is in Leviticus, you know, those, those, that part of the Old Testament we never read, right? <laughs> or we try and read very, very quickly. Right, right. But in chapter 11, in a couple of places, God is talking to Moses and he says, I am holy. And his desire is that all of Israel becomes holy, kadosh, like me. Right? So that's his, I want you to become. I don't want you to just do. I want some kind of change to happen with you that is something that moves, that is dynamic, that is active. It's not passive. But I want my people to become as I am. I want them to become Kadosh. Right? That's really interesting to me. If you're interested in more peer-reviewed, high-quality gospel scholarship about Latter-day Saint history, doctrine, or practice, such as this publication, as I always say, BYU's Religious Studies Center is a great place to check out. The RSC has recently published an exciting new book called Greater Love Hath No Man, a Latter-day Saint guide to celebrating the Easter season by Professor Eric D. Huntsman of BYU Ancient Scripture and Trevin G. Hatch from the BYU Harold B. Lee Library, who specializes in biblical ancient Near Eastern studies. This beautiful volume, and it is beautiful, follows the same user-friendly format of the earlier God So Loved the World, the final days of the Savior's life, organizing the chapters according to the traditional days of Holy Week with expanded discussion and additional materials. After discussing the scriptural accounts for each day of Holy Week, the chapters then summarize how these scriptural events have been celebrated through the centuries in different Christian traditions before sharing suggestions on how Latter-day Saints can both study the texts and commemorate these events in their own families. It's a great practical guide to make Holy Week truly a Holy Week. Again, the title of the book is 
Greater Love Hath No Man, a Latter-day Saint guide to celebrating the Easter season. Check it out and pick it up at rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Dr. Gay Strather and discuss her recent publication, Holiness to the Lord and Personal Temple Worship. In part two of our religion, like usual, we like to explore a little bit more about why this research matters. How can it help us in living, learning, or loving aspects of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? So here, Professor Strathern is going to help us analyze and apply how we can be prepared to be more holy as we worship in the sacred space of the Holy Temple. In what you've taught us so far, I think all of our listeners are probably thinking of of their own circumstances, their own situation, and the level of holiness. How far up the mountain have we have we ascended thus far? Would you help us understand as we enter the the temple, as we come into that sacred space, what you've taught us? How how can that help us deepen our own experience there? How, how can we gain in holiness as we enter the, the house of the Lord? Okay. There's a couple of things in the New Testament that I think are really important in kind of helping us make a little bit of a transition from that technical stuff into um, our personal experience today. So you'll recall that um, Mark tells us that when Jesus died at the temple, the veil was rent from top to bottom, right? Now, that veil was the, the, the... demarcation between the holy place and the holy of holies, right? Now, ancient Israel was once invited into the presence of God. Do you remember when uh, Moses was up there on Mount Sinai? He said, go and prepare the people. For in three days I will come and and be with them, right? Um, and when Moses came down and said that, uh, at first I think, oh, okay. And, and Moses says, go home and prepare yourself, right? But then they started thinking about it, maybe overthinking it a little bit, right? Uh, Is this something we really want? What was our experience when Moses was in the presence of God? What did we see? Lightning, thunderings, you know. The ancients honestly thought that entering the presence of God was a dangerous thing um, because um, as a human mortal, and the Book of Mormon teaches no unclean thing can dwell in the presence of God, that something that's impure entering the, the glory of the divine could be consumed um, by it. And, they, and I think, wonder if they're thinking about, about this. And so they said to Moses, you know what, Moses, we know that you have gone up in the mountain and you've survived this. Why don't you just go up and, and then you just come down and tell us what he said and that's what we'll do, right? But in terms of the implications of that, saying we don't want God in our presence, Right? We want an intermediary. And I think that that has an impact on the tabernacle where God was inviting all into his presence, but the fear of the people said we don't want that. And so now we have a high priest representing us entering the presence of God once a year. Um, but when Jesus dies, that, that veil that separated the people from the presence of God is ripped, Right? And symbolically, at least, that suggests to me that through Christ and his atoning sacrifice, that barrier between us and God has now been brought down. We still have to make the journey. We still have to climb the mountain spiritually to be able to do that. But his atoning sacrifice makes it possible for each and every one of us to enter the presence of God, right? Then in the book of Hebrews, um, uh, Uh, the author there really much uses the tabernacle to teach about Christ, right? And um, uh, Hebrews is going to say uh, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, which is the first tabernacle, while the the first tabernacle was yet standing. Um, We also learn in Hebrews that the invitation that for us to, remembering the Israelites' fear, right, to with boldness enter it. And and the word there means to have confidence to enter into the holiest and the praises of God. So worthy members of the church have the opportunity to today to enter the realm of Kodesh. Perhaps one of the things I think that we can think about is how can we prepare 
to enter that holy, sacred space, right? The, the, the priests certainly needed to do that, and they did certain things, certain rituals to help them to become holy. What, what might be the, the equivalent for us today? And here are just some things I'm throwing out. There are many, many more, and as individuals, I think it will be, uh, can be unique to us. But the things I've thought about, when I think about preparing to enter the temple, um, can I think more intently about partaking of the sacrament? each week, think about it in terms of I am coming here to renew covenants, yes, uh, to remember the Saviour, yes. But the prayer says that we're inviting a further endowment of the Spirit to be with us in this coming week, right? So am I thinking about that in terms of as I prepare to partake of the sacrament, as I prepare of the sacrament? Because I need the Spirit, right? That's going to be one of those cleansing things that will help me to be prepared as I enter the temple. Another thing I've thought about, and this may be autobiographical more than anything, but uh, we all live such very, very busy lives. Um, but are we intentional enough sometimes to set aside time where that busyness doesn't encroach upon us to the point that we can't be still and know that I am God, right? How do we allow the Spirit to speak to us if we're always busy, if we've always got on our headphones, if we're always uh, got the TV on, on the radio, in the car? When is the time when the Holy Ghost, which is a still small voice, can actually speak to us in a way that we can hear it? and then be willing to, to respond to that. But that's something that we have to be really, really intentional about in our daily lives. Well, it reminds me of your, your, your hike up Sinai. You know, there's a price to be paid yeah. and, the, and time and effort to be able to make that ascent. You're leaving the world behind, and that's not a, a, that's not a quick process. No. We've got to dare. We've got to make that be intentional to, to carve out that time. And the other thing I think of is... Uh, uh, thinking about ways to, again, carve out time to think of the things of eternity. I don't know about you, but, I, you know, I know about, I can talk about and quote scriptures about eternity, but the concept of eternity is way too much for my brain to get hold of. Right? Yeah, right. I live, I'm a mortal person living in a mortal realm with a beginning and an end, and thinking about eternity blows my mind in real ways. But taking the time to think and ponder about it, I think is really important because otherwise I find myself in that kind of that false sense of security. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what it's, it's, it's talking about. I mean, Jesus, in, in, I love it in John's Gospel um, where they're going to portray Jesus as John says, he's the one that cometh from above. Um, and, and I think that's saying, well, he's, he sees things from an eternal perspective. And one of the reasons he comes to earth, he condescends, even though they don't use that language, but he comes to, to deal with earthly people, us, um, who aren't from above um, and have a very limited view of what reality is. But Jesus has come to help us lift us up and to help us begin to get a peek at least into that eternal concept, which is so foreign to us at so many levels. The idea here that I would think about this, it's really important to go into Kodesh space, right? Um, but the goal of that experience is not to, that's not the, the end goal. The end goal is to enter Kodesh space so that in the process of doing that again and again and again, in that process, I start to take on the, con the, the characteristics of I start to become Kadosh, not just Kodesh. And that's why I like the nuance between the two. So I've got some, a couple of quotes here. Uh, so in Doctrine and Covenants 109, uh, this is the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, the prophet Joseph pled with the Lord, quote, that all people who shall enter upon the threshold of the Lord's house may feel thy power 
and feel constrained to acknowledge that it is thy house, a place of holiness. And then Elder Nelson, when he was a member of the Twelve, uh, also said, inscribed on each temple are the words holiness to the Lord. That statement designates both the temple and its holy its purposes as holy. Those who enter the temple are also to bear the attribute of holiness. It may be easier to ascribe holiness to a building than it is to a people, but we can acquire holiness only by enduring and persisting personal effort. Um, and I love that, right? And, and then um, Sister Elaine Dalton, um, she once said something that has just resonated with me um, and I don't know if I can quote it exactly, and so apologies to her, but this idea of we enter the temple so that the temple can enter us. And I love that, it's beautiful. right? I love that. Um, and so that's what makes me think. So how is the temple entering me? And I think this is kind of the process of Kadosh. And I've thought about Moses on Mount Sinai, and he, when he came down from that experience, he was shining, right? His face was shining. There was this tangible effect that um, was upon him as his face shone that lasted even after he came down um, off the mountain. And I thought about, is there a residual effect on me that lasts even when I come out of the temple, right? And, and is it, am I changed enough um, because of that experience that I'm a better person. President Hinckley promises you go to the temple, you will come out a better promise. He says, I promise you that. And so I thought about that and says, is that is that working for me? Um, and then how do I keep that? Because I think as we return to the world, the things of the world come upon us and we get... Um, and so I remember uh, uh, Robert J. Matthews taught me an important principle and he likened it um, to bodybuilding. He says, it's not enough to lift weights two or three times a year. You've got to lift weights often enough this is a, that there's a residual effect from the last lift. And I thought about that with the temple. Um, if I'm trying to be the goal is kadosh, um, am I going often enough that that there's still that residual effect of holiness that can then be built upon uh, when I return uh, to the temple. So that's a constant struggle for me. I don't live up to that ideal all of the time, right? But it is something I think about and think, okay, how am I going to, when I'm taking stock of myself, what do I need to do to, to help that to happen? So as I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about President Nelson's and his repeated uh, encouragements for us to make covenants, to stay on the covenant path, to help gather Israel on both sides of the veil. Well, where does that, so much of that take place? It's part of what we do in the temple, right? And uh, I, I love his emphasis here in trying to help us see this. He's not using the word but if I can be so bold, at least how I'm understanding that, he's asking us to do the things that will help us be kadosh, be actively involved in helping others, not just ourselves, but our families and our friends to be on the covenant path, to stay on the covenant path, even when life gets difficult, right? Even when life gets difficult, and it gets difficult for all of us. One other thing that I want to kind of uh, have us consider um, from President Nelson's teachings, as you, as you know, he has a uh, has put a, a, a large emphasis on the name of the church, um, and that we be known by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. And I am so grateful for that. I love the emphasis on Jesus Christ, and um, that uh, that that as a church we're followers of Him and His life and teachings and His atoning sacrifice and those kind of things. Um, I, I think it's important to also think about the other part of the name of Latter-day Saints, right? Because the word saint comes from the Hebrew word kadash, wow. right? This same word. So saints means holy ones, right? In its basic sense, it means holy ones. And as I read through the Old Testament, we find the word saints. Sometimes the word is used is translated as saints is Kodesh, 
and sometimes it's Kadosh. And that's kind of really interesting to me. And I thought, okay, what is, what's the implication of that? Well, and so, again, these are just my warblings on it, but I thought, okay, there's a way that as members of the church who have been baptised and who have made and are keeping covenants, God declares us Kodesh, right? But like for the ancient Israelites, his hope is always that we're not just Kodesh, but that we become the saints that are Kadosh as well, right? So we're members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That saints word is really, really important in terms of what we've been discussing today. And so I think about this in terms of my hiking of uh, Mount Sinai um, and the, the real thought that near enough is good enough. Um, but I am even this 30 odd years later, I'm still got a residual um, because of the spirit that I felt there. And that came because I didn't give up, because I kept going even when it was hard. And, uh, and because of that, I was uh, able to participate in something that was just so profoundly spiritual to me and has had reverberating effects ever since in my life. Well, and even now, you sharing that with us to, is extending that holiness. You know, it, it's that dynamic. We get to, 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 to lean into that kind of experience that you had and seek similar experiences ourselves. I, I'm grateful that you tied this into things that President Nelson has been teaching us lately, because I think I worry sometimes do we, we get so excited every conference to, to wait to the end and the big announcement and how many more temples will there be and where will they be? And I worry sometimes that as we get excited about the quantity of temples, do we lose sight of the quality of our own temple worship? And what you've taught us here today, oh, it makes me, it motivates me to want to go to that holy place and leave a little holier and then help others tap into that, that source of holiness themselves. Yeah. So grateful for this. Thank you. Thank you, Gay. Thanks, Jared. If you're interested in reading all of Professor Strathern's article, Holiness to the Lord and Personal Temple Worship, we've included a link to the full text from the original publication on our website at whyreligion.byu.edu. There you can also get access to other episodes and their content, as well as learn more about Professor Strathern. And since Professor Strathern has been on Why Religion before, if you've loved learning from her, I'd also encourage you to go and listen to her earlier Why Religion episode, episode number 38 on keeping the Sabbath day holy. There's great insights there on a holy day for a holy people. Okay, we've arrived at our last segment, part three, where we like to discuss things more personally with the professor. So to conclude this episode, based on her personal experience, Dr. Strathern is going to give her advice and perspective for church members about how to keep climbing the mountain of holiness, regardless of our varied circumstances. She also talks about how she has developed her own personal love of scriptures. I want to spend the last few minutes with you, Gay, just talking about your own personal experience. You, in the first Why Religion podcast episode that you, that you recorded, you were so beautifully vulnerable and personal at the end as you talked about your experience being a part of a part member family. Uh, and faithful converts in your mother and grandmother and, and, and a father that, that hadn't joined the church. You talked about being a member in Australia and what a difference it was to be a, a, a tiny minority religion in one place and then moving to Utah and being part of the, the mammoth <laughs> majority faith. You, you talked about what it was like to be a single member in a church that focuses so much on the family. And I hope that our listeners, if you didn't get a chance, will go back and get to know you better in that, in that first interview. But building on that, you, you seem to have connections or possible connections with so many different types of people in the church that may not feel like they fit the mold. Uh, and as we're talking about this, ultimately the mold is Christ, ultimately the mold is holiness. Can you, what advice would you give to a church member that might feel like they're on the outside looking in or that they're lower down on the mountain? Uh, what encouragement could you give them to keep, to keep climbing? Thank you. <clears throat> well, um, 
Honestly, I have to say I have definitely felt those feelings at times. Um, and so when I'm answering you in that question, I hope everyone will realise I'm just talking about my personal experience and I understand that uh, people all have those feelings from different places and uh, so what I say might not be necessarily applicable um, to them in the way that it is for me. So... Um, I think one of the things that I would say is um, I have worked very hard in my life not to be categorised by a single member of the church. I want to be known as somebody who is a member of the ward or of the stake or of the church, right? I don't want to be set aside as different and I don't want to celebrate that difference although I acknowledge it and it's my life and that's okay but what I want is to be a part of the group. And so I have worked really really hard at that. Um, now I am a not a naturally gregarious person right I'm you might not believe this but I'm actually very shy and uh, I find it very hard to to be the life of the party or uh, to just uh, um, instigate uh, uh, conversations with people and, and things like that. That's something I have to work on really, really hard. And sometimes I succeed and sometimes I don't. But as I've thought about this and, and have with the, the feeling that I, it seems like I'm going to be single for a long time, part of my membership in my church, I was kind of saying, okay, so if I come saying I'm different and I don't belong, then that's going to be problematical. So one of the things that I've consciously tried to do is to say, okay, what am I, I going to do to belong? What am I going to do to contribute uh, to the ward? Um, and uh, how can I uh, help others. I don't, do I come to church just so that I'll be filled or do I take a responsibility to try and help fill in someone else's ways that they're struggling? Because all of us struggle, right? It's just in, in different ways. It's one of the reasons why I made a conscious decision to not be in a singles ward but to go to the family ward because I wanted the total experience of being a member of a ward. I wanted the opportunity to be able to to serve in primary or young women's um, and not just Sunday school or relief society. So, so that was a conscious choice and, uh, uh, and I think that it's served me well. I've also thought, uh, so <clears throat> there are certain things that you learn by being part of a nuclear family and an extended one. But you learn things. You learn things about love. You learn things about sacrifice. You learn things, all of those wonderful things of being part of a family, and I wasn't going to experience that. So I had to find ways where I could serve in other ways, that I could learn about sacrifice in other ways. And uh, sometimes it's worked and sometimes it's been... But I've surrounded me, myself with friends who, uh, who helped me in that process of trying to find ways to serve and to sacrifice. Oh, I think that's beautiful advice. And we get to be the beneficiaries of being part of your extended church family. And yeah. we're grateful for that, Gay. It's interesting because you spend so much of your time in Scripture and, and helping people find those nuances that you taught us today. I'm, I'm curious, where did your love of Scripture come from? <laughs> well, I'm a little weird because it was kind of young. <laughs> Right, and honestly, uh, it it was first peaked because I, I told you I was in a small branch of the church. There weren't very many people there, and there certainly weren't a lot of people my age, but a, a family joined the church, right? And they had a child who was my age, and we became fast friends, right? And they were new members of the church, and so as my friend was turning 12 and about to... Uh, um, participate in the priesthood, his parents gave him a, a 
triple combination, but it was a missionary triple combination. You know, today they're all the same, but in those days there were differences, mm. right? So a missionary one had the thumb tabs and the the really fine paper and things like that. And 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 we were such good friends that we did everything together, right? And so I thought, oh, John's got one, so I want one, right? And so I thought this was a righteous thing, and I went to my mum and said, Mum, can I have a missionary triple combination? <laughs> and she said, no. And I was stunned by that, right, because I thought it was a righteous thing. And she said, we've got plenty of them out there. You go and use them. But she didn't understand it needed to be missionary thumb tabs and things <laughs> like that. And I tried and tried and she wouldn't do it. What I didn't realise until later is my father was out of work at this time and, you know, I can understand that. But I had to change track, right? And so I said, so, Mum, if I save up my money, which was going to be $12 in those days, can I get one? And she said, yes. So that's what I did. And I remember the day that she took me up to Brisbane. So it was an hour's drive to the church bookstore to go and buy a missionary triple combination with the thumb tabs and the really fine paper. And, you know, I'd put some effort into that. And I'm so glad that mum made me do it because now this was important to me. And so I sat there and I, you know, I unstuck all of the pages and and then I thought, okay, what am I going to do with this? And then I thought about my brother-in-law and his missionary scriptures, and he'd color-coded everything, right? Purple was baptism, yellow was Godhead, red was resurrection. So I thought, okay, I'm going to do that. And so I embarked on this process, right? And I wrote the best I could, and I did it all. And in the process of that, I'm going, whoa, this is a really fun scripture. Whoa, I didn't know that. Oh, and so I learned this love of the scriptures and so that when Christmas came and I said, Mum, I want a Bible, she, she had no qualms now because this has been important. And so that, that was just one of those life moments that kind of impacts the trajectory. Um, and I've loved studying the scriptures ever, ever since, right? But I never thought that it would be a career, right? I was a physical therapist in Australia. I had no thoughts that this kind of part of my life would ever, ever exist. But the trip to Jerusalem made a huge difference. And then I went on my mission, but I came back and I said, I loved everything that I learned in Jerusalem. So I want to keep that study. And so I came over here and uh, just started working on it. And just the more, I, so this is the, the other thing, because I'd started as young and learning the scriptures, by the time I was kind of a young adult, I thought, oh, I know the scriptures, right? I could give a talk on most things. I thought I was pretty good. But when I went to Jerusalem, I thought, oh, there is so much more. Every time I went in a door, it just opened up more doors. And I thought, oh gosh, there's so much more. So I realized then, not how much I knew, but how much I didn't know. Right, And as I've embarked upon this journey in studying, um, uh, what I've learned is I've just been reinforced, not him, about how much I don't know, because every time I go through a door, there's a hundred more doors there to, to be open to. And so I've thought, I've, I really like something that Elder and Sister Hafen wrote about, um, what is it, the simplicity beyond complexity. I think that that's what it is. Right, right. I think as a... a a, uh, a young adult, I was still in the simplicity before complexity. I think I thought I knew the gospel. But as I've studied and all of these doors have opened and uh, the nuance and sometimes the tension in scripture, I don't see tension as a negative thing. It can be really healthy tension. But paying that price to kind of study, and I'm grateful that I'm a teacher because I get to do it professionally, right? Um, uh, and as I've learned and grown, my my testimony, my understanding of the gospel has become more nuanced. I think more deep. I, I think that it's going to be something that I'll continue doing for the rest of my life. So there's that on one side. But the other side is going and getting a, a PhD um, in a very, very academic, secular environment. Um, the thing that I think I learned most was asking questions of the scriptures. Don't assume anything, but ask questions. And it was those questions that have been most important because that's why I'm thinking, well, what's the difference between Kadosh and Kodesh, right? And why should I care or whatever? But it's asking those questions that have also kind of opened up nuances to me. And doing asking the questions through the lens of the gospel of Jesus Christ means that I may come up with very different answers than what my colleagues in graduate school would, but it is just uh, 
just been also a very transformative experience for me. I have a foundation, I think, of testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that Joseph Smith was the prophet of the restoration, that God and his Son loves me, not just collectively as part of a group, but he loves me. And the way that I know that most is because he's answered my prayers, Um, not with a theophany on Mount Sinai and not in a sacred grove, but usually through um, the inspiration of people around me who uh, know when to reach out when most I need it, right? And I need it a lot, actually. Uh, I have to say I need to be inspired. I need others to, support, to, to, to say and teach things that help me in my continuing growth. And I'm so grateful for all of the people who do that. Um, that's why I love the gospel. I love um, learning about it. But mostly I love the testimonies of the people that give me the strength to keep going on. And... Uh, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that if I could just believe then I have a chance of eternal life and maybe uh, one day God can declare to me my Kadosh and not just my Kodesh. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat, the host and producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from BYU Religious Education, Jared Halverson, Ryan Sharp, Hank Smith, Beverly Yellowhorse, Elena Wainsgard, and Brad Wilcox. Recording, mixing, and original music was done by BYU student Mitchell Bashford. Say hi, Mitchell. Hey, guys. Original music and scoring for Why Religion Podcast was also created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.